You might have heard that the neighborhoods of Paris look like a snail when you map them out. This is the map you get when you Google where to stay in Paris. But why does it look that way? In this video, I'm going to show you another map of Paris. One that tells a story of war and peace, monarchies and revolutions, and one that helps you orient yourself with the history of the city, no matter in which arrondissement you find yourself. So Paris began right here in this little island in the middle of the Seine called the Ile de la Cité that has been at the center of European trade and movement for centuries. So 2000 years ago, the Ile de la Cité was inhabited by a Gaulish tribe known as the Parisi. Okay, I know these guys weren't Parisians, but they were Gauls. The island served both as a natural fortress and a great place to cross the Seine River. This island was so well situated that it was eventually conquered by the Romans, and they renamed it Lutetia. They expanded the bounds of the city past the island and onto the left bank. The Romans followed their playbook for city planning and started by establishing a Cardo Maximus, a north-south boulevard to which all the other roads of the city are laid out at right angles to form a grid. Today, the Rue Saint-Jacques roughly follows this original route. When you look at the map, you can kind of use Saint-Jacques as a y-axis for the city and the Seine as an x-axis. The Seine divides the city into the right and the left bank. The river flows west. So when you're looking west, it's right and left. So that is the deepest foundation of the city of Paris as we know it today. Eventually though, the Roman Empire collapsed. From then on, the history gets really dense and complicated. Paris gets invaded over and over again. The Franks take over and establish a monarchy. Some guy walks around with a severed head and people start building churches and hospitals all over the city. Kings get wealthy and build palaces, plazas, gardens. Wars are fought, the Renaissance happens, revolutions, imperialism, republics, Nazis, bedbugs. And over two millennia and all those things happening, Paris has sprawled out into an organic spider web of a city with its 20 arrondissements ending up in the shape of a snail shell. So while this map is helpful when you're trying to book a hotel, there's another map that can help you orient yourself in the history of Paris. This is a map of the historical walls of Paris. As time goes on, the walls expand like the rings of a tree. Most of these walls have been demolished, but their outlines form the foundation of Paris's arrondissement and many of its streets. So let's dive deeper into this map. And to start, I'm going to call upon our special guests. And by special guests, I mean our good friends at Thatch. Thatch is kind of like the travel agency of the future. But instead of an old school travel agency filled with people that don't necessarily travel like you, it's an online travel marketplace where local experts from more than 80 countries are selling bespoke guides, custom itineraries, and truly personalized planning services. So like, there really hasn't been anything like this before. The app allows creators to create these interactive travel guides that connect straight into maps and booking sites. This means you can have everything you need to plan an epic trip in one convenient location. So I've even teamed up with a Thatch creator for this video. Her name's Hilary. She's in Paris right now and she's on her way to show us the first wall on our map. Hi everyone, my name is Hilary and I'm a thatch creator specializing in guides for Paris and France. And the things that I'm going to find for you today are things I think I've walked past a million times before and never noticed. My first stop today is on Rue de la Colombe on Ile de la Cité. There is so much to see on Ile de la Cité like the Notre Dame and Saint-Chapelle, but today I want to show you some cobblestones. And I'm not going to lie, the first time I tried to find them I totally missed them, that's how much they blend in. These stones are where the first medieval wall of Paris used to run, along the edge of the island. The Gallo-Romans of Lutetia built this wall to protect against invaders. There are two things this old wall shows us. First, the Roman city was reduced by these attacks. The left and right banks didn't matter anymore. And second, the original landmass of the island was much smaller than it is today. Later, the Roman Empire collapsed. A group of people known as the Franks invade and Paris becomes part of the Frankish kingdom. Eventually, a guy called Philippe Auguste becomes ruler and he is known as the first king of the Franks. There were other kings before him, but he's kind of a big deal. In 1215, Philippe started building a new wall around the city. It had a moat on the right bank. He also built a small fortress to protect the western end of the city 
known as the Louvre Fortress. There are actually many hidden remnants of the Philippe Auguste Wall all around this part of the city. You can find it inside courtyards or underground parking lots or random pieces of sidewalk. I'm here at the Jardin Rosier Joseph Minieret, and look what I've just found. This is just a little bit more exciting than the cobblestones we just saw. The garden is also nestled in the Jewish district, so you'll find great Jewish bakeries and falafel and lots of other restaurants nearby. I'm on my way to try to find one more piece of this wall. It's apparently inside a restaurant, so I'm not sure I can go in to see it, but maybe we can see it from outside through the window. That was such a fun little scavenger hunt. I think I deserve a coffee, so I'm ending here at Le Peloton Cafe, which is one of my favorite coffee shops in Paris, located just near the Seine on the right bank. I have so many more personal recommendations to share with you, so if you're ever planning on visiting Paris, check out my fat shop. I have created over 20 guides, many of which are free, including my favorite coffee shops, laptop-friendly cafes, French restaurants, best street food and cheap eats, hidden gems on the right bank and left bank, and more. A bientôt, au revoir. This wall provided safety to the city, and the population of Paris started to skyrocket. By 1300, Paris's population had grown to 230,000, which doesn't sound like a lot by today's terms, but at the time it was the largest city in Europe. The city had actually started breaking past the wall, and during this time many great landmarks were constructed, like the Notre Dame and the Saint-Chapelle. <laughs> One of the most turbulent times in Paris's history is known as the Hundred Years' War. This is not one war that lasted a hundred years, but rather a series of conflicts between the Kingdom of France and the Kingdom of England. These conflicts took place over many years and many sets of rulers. And mainly the fighting was about who was to be the rightful ruler of France. French and English royalty had lots of crossed bloodlines and the situation got quite complicated and messy and unfortunately for everyone else in Europe deadly. So this is when the ruler Charles V built this wall. He only built it on the right bank because the left bank had stayed pretty much the same. The left bank was kind of a university district which is now known as the Latin Quarter but the right bank is where most of Paris's residents lived. The wall itself had six city gates. Four of them are still around today. The Port Saint Antoine was a gate that was situated next to the Bastille. Famously, with the revolution, the Bastille was demolished and today this is the Place de la Bastille. The Port du Temple, or Temple, is today a square called the Place de la République. So if you can still see this little label, the Charles V wall actually put the Louvre inside of the new city walls. So it was no longer necessary for defense. Charles turned this into a palace and he made it his primary residence. And this was the start of the Louvre's evolution into the world's largest art museum. So talking about fancy residences, I don't have label for this one but let's move on to this fancy house called the Conseil d'Etat. Now it's a government building but it used to be one guy's home. Cardinal Richelieu. Richelieu was the chief minister to King Louis XIII and besides being a formidable statesman he was also a shrewd property developer. So much so that when he wanted to build his palace here he convinced Louis XIII to demolish an entire section of the Charles V wall and then he had the wall extended and then he bought up all the properties in between. Subsequently he had a huge garden to match his huge house. The Grand Palais Cardinal. The demolished Charles V wall was filled in and turned into the Rue du Mai and the Rue d'Aboukir. So after Louis XIII came Louis XIV, also known as Louis le Grand. This is him at age 16. This pretty boy was about to leave a massive mark on the city of Paris. Louis XIV reigned at the height of absolutism, a time when people thought that kings were given their authority by God. And maybe kings might even be gods. Louis was known as the Sun King and was famous for his lavish court life, his fancy parties and his excessive amount of mistresses. All of which he built dramatic 
flamboyant infrastructure for, including the Palace of Versailles. He fought and won his fair share of wars, and to defend all the territory that he claimed, he built over 300 fortresses around France. This new extended line of defense made him confident to demilitarize France. Hey guys, Editing Drian here. I'm about to show you a map very nonchalantly in this video, but this map is actually wild. This map is called the Turgo map. It's from 1730. You can literally zoom in and see the doors and trees of every building. So the guy who made this map actually had free reign to enter every residence in Paris at the time and he took account of every tree, door and window. So when you see a tree on this map, it actually existed in Paris in 1730. I knew I was going to use this map to talk about the next section of the video, but once I actually started using it, I was blown away. Anyways, back to the video. He demolished the city walls and replaced them with Grand Boulevard, wide tree-lined avenues that people could ride their horses through. Louis also had the west end of the Louvre, the Tuileries Palace and its garden, enlarged and extended. Beyond this garden, he had an avenue extend westwards towards the outskirts of Paris, so that the Tuileries Garden would have a vista, and this became known as the Grand Coup. This avenue is what would eventually become the Champs-Élysées, and the historic axis of Paris. But at the time, there wasn't really much here except for a trail that ran up a hill. Now that the walls were gone, Louis had triumphant arches constructed in his honor. Louis XIV had by this time fought and won wars against the Spanish and the Dutch. And these two arches are full of symbolism and inscriptions that describe his victories. Another one of Louis XIV's landmarks lies further out of the city. So Louis XIV married his double cousin Marie Therese on the border between France and Spain. When he came back to Paris, there was a huge celebration. A procession walked to the spot that was prepared for the occasion and he went and sat down on a huge throne. And the square became known as the Place du Trône. But today it's the Place de la Nation. So that's Louis Le Grand and he's kind of a big deal. And he ended up reigning for 72 years, a record that he holds up until this day. So moving further out, a new wall. And this time it's not for defense. In 1784, five years before the revolution, this is where they built a brick wall called the Farmer's General Wall. The purpose of this wall was to control the flow of goods in and out of the city and to enforce tolls. Now, if people wanted to get into the city, they had to do so through one of the wall's 62 gates. Right over here is where the Grand Coup met a bunch of hunting trails. When this wall was built, it initially became a toll gate. But in 1806, after winning the Battle of Austerlitz, Napoleon commissioned a grand arch to be built here, the Arc de Triomphe de l'Etoile. This was only completed in 1836 under Louis-Philippe's reign. Back then it was just a simple intersection, but today it's a giant roundabout where 12 avenues meet to form the star shape. And after the death of President Charles de Gaulle, they renamed it in his memory. So Place de l'Etoile and Place de la Nation actually have metro stations that act as nodes for lines 1, 2 and 6 which followed the Farmer's General Wall and the Seine respectively. You can learn more about that in our video about the Paris Metro. The toll gates that they built for the Farmer's General Wall were actually quite grand and you can still go see a bunch of them today. Moving outwards even more, the next and final wall we're going to talk about is the Thiers fortification. This was a huge, thick, 33 kilometer long combination of walls and ditches that was completed in 1846. The idea for this wall actually came 30 years earlier. At the end of the Napoleonic Wars, Napoleon had botched his invasion of Russia. He lost the Battle of Leipzig and he was on the run from the Sixth Coalition, which was a large collection of European nations that Napoleon had managed to make his enemies. The Sixth Coalition chased Napoleon out of Russia and pressed on to invade Paris. They ended up taking control of the city. France surrendered, Napoleon was forced into exile, and the coalition reinstated a monarch like the revolution had never even happened. The fact that the coalition forces could march into Paris willy-nilly made the new monarchy question if being an open city was such a good idea after all. So in 1830, King Louis-Philippe commissioned a new wall that could be manned by France's National Guard. This commission was to be implemented by Prime Minister Adolphe Thiers, 
and it encircled not only the city of Paris but some of the neighboring towns around it. The project also involved building 16 bastion forts lying about 2 to 5 kilometers outside of the city. The wall was about 6 meters off the ground and it had a 25 meter ditch on the outside so the guards could fire at attackers trying to approach. There was also this demarcated building free zone that extended for 250 meters outside of the walls. This soon became kind of like an informal park where Parisians would go for walks and have picnics. So this new wall created kind of like an interesting social dynamic. Legally, Paris ended at the farmer's general wall. So any restaurant or business that opened up between these two walls was not subject to the same import tax as the inside of the city. So these towns became super popular places for dance halls and restaurants to open up because food and drink could be sold tax-free. On the flip side, the no-build zone outside of the wall quickly became a place for people who could not afford to live inside the city to build informal settlements. The ditches outside of the wall became a slum known as the zone. Since the construction of the wall, there have been many unsuccessful attempts to get rid of these slums. By 1921, the zone was home to 42,000 people. In 1849, Louis-Philippe was overthrown in a revolution. And the original Napoleon's nephew, Louis Napoleon, was elected president. Louis Napoleon had lived in London, which at the time to him seemed like a picture of modernity. And after he was elected, he made it his mission to modernize Paris. Paris had at this point seen decades of unrest. The tight neighborhoods were also overcrowded and riddled with disease. So Louis Napoleon said that he wanted to open up Paris's streets and to bring light and air into every corner of the city. But by the time his term ended in 1851, he hadn't really gotten much done. He was also blocked for running a second term by the constitution. So as one does, he staged a coup and declared himself the emperor of France. Being emperor is awesome because it means that if you want to redecorate, you can do as you like. Louis Napoleon, now known by his royal name of Napoleon III, employed this guy, Baron Haussmann, to completely redesigned the city on a scale that Paris had never seen before. He completely demolished several neighborhoods, built long grand boulevards, commissioned massive green spaces, laid new sewers and aqueducts, built monuments and plazas. It's hard to overstate how much work he actually did. 70 of the streets that he built are known as Perseys, which means breakthrough. These are streets that cut through the existing neighborhoods and to build them, he demolished everything that was in the way. He ended up demolishing 20,000 buildings and displacing 350,000 people. Hausmann started as the Romans did, by building a new axis for the city. Just before the Exposition Universelle in 1855, Hausmann was tasked with laying a grand east-west boulevard that would lead up to the center of the Exposition. To do so, Hausmann cut through this area here to extend the Rue de Rivoli. It took 3,000 workers working nonstop for two years to demolish and rebuild the area around the street. Also, the Ausman could make a straight line to the Palais de l'Industrie, which doesn't even exist anymore. For the North-South Boulevard, there were already two candidates that Haussmann could have chose to just widen and extend. The Rue de Saint-Martin and Rue de Saint-Denis. Instead, Husband chose to bulldoze right between these two to create this new north-south avenue. Now the Port Saint-Denis and Port Saint-Martin are simply decorations for his grand boulevard. In 1860, Napoleon III annexed all the neighborhoods that were between the TA fortification and the farmer's general wall, bringing the number of arrondissements up from 12 to 20. This is when the map of the neighborhoods was redrawn and got the snail shape it has today. After this annexation, Haussmann's work entered a new phase. He had to figure out how to connect all of these new neighborhoods with the center of the city. He decided to demolish the farmer's general wall. 26 of the 54 original tall gates were turned into plazas or plus and they were connected to a big boulevard that became a new ring road for the city. And then in between World Wars 1 and 2, the Thiers fortification was demolished. It opened up a 33 kilometer long, 390 meters wide corridor 
for the city to develop. In 1958, George Pompidou commissioned the Boulevard Périphérique to be built here, which was basically a collection of large highways and was great for people who liked cars. In 2016, the government came up with the concept of the Metropole du Grand Prairie. The total area of this metropole is 814 square kilometers and it houses 7 million people. As Paris has grown, more ring roads and train lines have sprung up to connect these neighborhoods into one coherent city. And that's where we're going to end our map shenanigans for today. These original walls tell a story of a city that has grown and adapted through millennia of war and peace. If this video made you keen to travel to Paris, don't let the labyrinth of wishy-washy information on the internet get you down. If you hop over to Thatch, you'll be able to find guides on the city of Paris, or you can even book a local expert to help you plan a personalized and epic travel itinerary. Also, one of my main sources for this video was The Making of Paris by Russell Kelly. It's an amazing resource that goes into detail about the history of Paris's urban development. There's so much more than I can ever put in a YouTube video. As always, thanks for watching. Stay curious.